Welcome to Purdue University College of Science Superheroes of Science podcast. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sarah. We will be discussing anything and everything related to the science classroom and interviewing scientists. Because as we know, scientists are the superheroes behind the science. So join us as we learn about the scientists and explore current trends in K-12 science education. Welcome to Superheroes of Science. We're here today with Dan Sitso, Department Head and Professor in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. Welcome, Dan. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. You're here at Purdue, and I'm not sure where to start with you. You're a complex critter. I am a complex critter. That is absolutely true. Okay, so you came to Purdue from MIT. That's correct. Do I remember yeah. this right? So what is? Let's talk. Let's start with your backstory. Yeah, that's what. That, that's why I like to hear from you because I don't know it. Absolutely no. I have I have <laughs> sort of a circuitous path to get here, but uh, it, it's been a fun one, and it's probably a good one to um, have students listen to because it'll give them some idea that you can start out in one direction and completely change fields, and things can work out just fine. So uh, I actually grew up in Chicago. I'm, I'm one of the few people actually born and raised in the city. Um, ended up doing uh, my undergraduate at the University of Illinois, which I try to be quiet of when I'm uh, on Purdue campus, just <laughs> I in understand. case I get myself in trouble. Um, and I was actually an aeronautical and astronautical engineer as an undergrad. Oh. And I went to uh, JPL um, after, after I finished my degree. Um, and worked for several years. And uh, at that time, I thought I was going to go back to graduate school in engineering. I thought I was going to mm -hmm. continue to do sort of work on spacecraft. And one of the jobs that I had was uh, essentially maneuvering the space probe. This was the old Galileo space probe that was on its way to Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And as part of that job, I started working with some of the atmospheric scientists, the folks doing measurements for Jupiter. Um, and we were talking about, you know, where would the, the probe point, what measurements they were trying to make. And I got to sit in on some of the talks that they were giving. And I got really intrigued by this. And uh, so I started sort of changing my mind about, you know, where I was going to go, engineering versus science. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time it sort of really clicked. And uh, I, I kind of had in my head that I was going to go to Caltech because I was in Southern California working. And I uh, had a chance to come home uh, back to Chicago uh, to see the family and made a trip to the University of Chicago and met uh, John Abbott, who became my PhD advisor. And he was talking about them. Now, I'm getting rather old, so this was the 90s. Um, and he was talking about particles in the atmosphere and formation of clouds, which was what some of these folks were looking at for Jupiter. But he was talking about like ozone loss and how you could do chemistry on these, these special particles and how this might impact climate. And so, you know, hit rewind for kids today, they're, they're thinking they've grown up with this idea of climate change. In the 90s, we were just really starting, yeah. in the infancy, we were just starting to talk about it. And so so I, I bought it hook, line, and sinker. I, I was all in. And so I ended mm -hmm. up um, finishing up my job at, at JPL and, and accepting a graduate offer from John to go back to the University of Chicago. And uh, from, from there, uh, I, I actually have sort of remained in, in touch with my roots in, in aeronautical and astronautical engineering because uh, a lot of what we do is building instruments for the field, predominantly for aircraft. So we deploy oh. instruments on aircraft. We make measurements in, in, in the atmosphere. And so uh, that led me to a, a postdoc at, at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Oh. Yeah. So we got a chance to work with some NASA research aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, I had a chance to work overseas doing much the same thing uh, in Switzerland at a, a school called ETH, which is a fancy name for the Swiss Technical University. Um, had a chance to, to do a little bit of work for Department of Energy and then ended up at, at MIT um, for about the last 10 years before coming to Purdue and, and taking over as department head and, uh, and also continuing to do the research that we're working on. Nice. Wow. Um, which question I ask first then? Because that brought a lot of questions. Let's start with those opportunities that you mentioned. You said you had the opportunity to go to Switzerland. So how did these opportunities come up? I mean, it's that that doesn't sound like something I hear about every day. Oh yeah, I had the opportunity when I went to Switzerland, did some you know research. Yeah, it, it's funny how those things come up. Uh, I, I think it's it's both. Uh, what is that uh, definition of of luck? Is when opportunity meets preparation. Um, and so uh, <laughs> I've, I've been very lucky in my life. Um, and I think part of it is just being in the right place at the right time. 
um, but it's also being open to, to those things. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a very understanding wife uh, who's willing to do things like <laughs> move to Europe uh, at the drop of a hat. Um, oh. She's actually traveled more and lived in more places than I have. But um, it, it was a funny story. My advisor in Switzerland, Ulrika Lohmann, um, actually wrote me an email message and asked if I had any students in my group that might be interested in taking a job in her group in Switzerland. And I wrote her back and said, well, what about me? Um, and so uh, Kristen, my wife, and I had talked about the chance to, to live in Europe, and, and we still have some family there. And so it was just one of these, you know, sort of great opportunities that, that just presented itself, and, and we grabbed it. And Ulrika said, yeah, it would be great to have you come over for, you know, three years um, and, and, you know, build up a group doing the type of measurements that we were doing. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, a fantastic opportunity, um, and, you know, we, we loved every minute of it. Wow. So what type of research were you doing there in particular? Yeah, so uh, that's one of the interesting things that we work on. So I, I mentioned earlier that we work on particles and clouds in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And so most of your listeners are, are probably familiar with climate change. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when you ask 99% of people about climate change, they say, oh, it's carbon dioxide, um, which is which is part of the story. Um, it's you know, humans are, are putting more and more CO2 into the atmosphere. It absorbs the heat coming off of the planet. It, it traps it. It acts like a blanket. It reflects some of that back to the surface. And so we get warmer as a result. But um, what most folks don't know is that humans are also putting particles into the atmosphere at the same time. Um, maybe that's not so much of a surprise if, you know, you commuted to work today like I did, um, and there's a bus in front of you and it's belching out smoke, um, or you see, you know, uh, right now there's there's folks that are doing some burning around here, especially at the mm -hmm. end of the, the harvest season. Um, so, so those are human-made particles, um, but folks don't necessarily think of them as being a player in climate, but they, they really are. Um, they, they do that two ways. One is something that we call the direct effect. Those particles can either trap uh, heat, they can, they can either absorb heat, um, just like a, a CO2 molecule would, really, m much the same way. Um, they can also scatter light, though. Um, and so this is maybe not such a surprise if you've ever been in a city on, on a smoggy day. So smog particles are, are really largely due to humans. Um, but you get that sort of diffuse light when you're out in a, a smoggy event, just like a foggy day would be. And what's happening is some sunlight is being reflected back into space. It's not making it to the surface to heat the planet up. So if you have lots of human-made particles, something we call anthropogenic particles, um, they can scatter a lot of sunlight, and they can actually lead to a local cooling effect. So that's the direct effect. The other thing is the indirect effect. Um, and that's when particles act as the seeds on which clouds form. So that little particle can act as the condensation site that water condenses on or ice nucleates on. And so you can get what we call warm clouds, liquid water clouds, or cold clouds, ice clouds. And, and those clouds largely reflect sunlight, just like we see on a day where we go out and it's cloudy and you don't feel the sun on you and it's too cool or something like that. Mm -hmm. But the key to this is that if humans are putting out particles and particles can form clouds, then we actually have a negative impact on climate. We have a cooling impact on climate. It actually doesn't win out over the warming from the greenhouse gases, predominantly CO2. Um, it, it's a lesser effect. So when you add them together, you still get a warming. You, you still get global warming. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't understand the negative effect and the positive effect, you can't add them together properly to get the total effect. And so that's what my group predominantly does is we're trying to understand the emission of those particles. What are they? Especially the human ones, but but also the natural ones. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how they impact cloud formation and what's going to end up being the result of this. How many more clouds are we going to get? Um, how much cooling are we going to get that offsets a bit of that warming? My son just did a project about nanotechnology and he's in eighth grade and he was really excited about learning about nanoparticles and things. And so this listening to this, just I think a question he might have, um, those particles that you were talking about, how do they compare in size to a CO2 molecule? Oh, that's a great question. So um, the very smallest particles, mm -hmm. the, the nanoparticles, mm -hmm. as you said, are, are um, you know, we think of particles starting out at a, at a few nanometers okay. in size. Mm -hmm. And so y you already have many, many thousands of, of atoms or molecules that are inside of that particle. So they're, they're many thousands of, of times larger than those okay. single molecules at that point. Mm -hmm. um, 
but they're still small enough that we don't see them. Um, so, so even just the, the standard particles in, in the atmosphere mm-hmm. are, you know, many, many times smaller than the, the width of a human hair. So in class, sometimes I do that. I, I, I try to pull a hair out and look <laughs> at it. And, yeah. and that gives you some idea of scale. So, you know, human hair is on the order of about 50 microns, oh. um, 10 to the minus six meters in diameter. Mm-hmm. So you take that human hair and you have to sort of split it up 50 or 100 times just to get to a big particle in the atmosphere. And so right now when we're in this room, um, every cubic centimeter of, of air in this room has some hundreds or even thousands of, of particles in it. But they're so small that we don't perceive them. We're sitting in this cloud of particles. Mm-hmm. I always joke with the students, oh, take a deep breath and you know, you just yeah. inhaled thousands and thousands of, of particles. So, um, so, so to our perception, they're really not that different, but to them, they're, they're very many, you know, orders of magnitude difference in size. Okay. Thank you. I want to wear a mask now. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. Go get your surgical mask. I'm going to order one more now (laughs) or today for tomorrow, hopefully. (laughs) Now. All right. So I overheard some people talking and I didn't want to interrupt them and be that guy, but, uh, I know. What stopped me from usually doing it? I, I, I saw it in your eyes. <laughs> but uh, they were talking, and they were they were probably about my age, and they're like, "Oh yeah, all we used to hear about was a hole in the ozone and that greenhouse effect." Now those scientists don't talk about that; they just talk about climate change or global warming. And so, uh, could you explain how these are related? Yeah, and, and why absolutely. our terminology and why we're how we're talking about things have changed. Yeah, so um, let's start with the ozone hole because that, that was, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that sort of drew me into this field. And this was something that, that, that we discovered, scientists discovered in, in the 1980s, really. Mm-hmm. You could argue maybe end of the 70s, but really into the 80s. And so um, this was due to a very special chemical that, that we were producing um, that still actually is probably around in this room. And these are CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. These are only produced by humans. They're not naturally occurring. Um, people think of them as being in the spray cans, the, the hairsprays yeah. and the deodorants and things like that. And that's absolutely hair. true. Yeah. But these were actually kind of a miracle chemical when they came up. Um, they were completely inert. We thought that they would never break down. Um, that was how naive we were when they were invented. Um, but they were used for a whole host of different things. Like in this room, when we're sitting on old chairs, the foam in these chairs, mm-hmm. that, that airspace in there is not actually air. In, in old foam, a lot of times it's CFCs, oh. these, these chlorofluorocarbons. I didn't know that. Uh, the soundproof tiles on the room, same, same thing. And so um, these CFCs make it in the atmosphere. And what happens is when they make it very high up in the atmosphere, the next level up, we live in the troposphere, the next level up is the stratosphere. When they make it into the stratosphere, they can encounter sunlight that's at a shorter wavelength, more energetic than what we receive at the surface. It's kind of like the stuff that gives us uh, like a sunburn. Um, but when you make it high enough up, you're above the ozone layer. You have these more energetic uh, photons and, and they're able to hit these CFCs and, and break them up. And so um, what was found was that there is some very special chemistry that goes on in the polar stratosphere. There's uh, ice clouds in the polar stratosphere. And on the surface of these ice crystals, you can have chemistry with the products of these CFCs um, that, that leads to a, a reactive halogen species, a reactive chlorine, um, that can start chewing up, catalytically chewing up ozone. And so in the 80s, um, we had satellites that were advanced enough to, to see this. And what we would find is that as spring started in the polar stratosphere, the ozone would go away, boom, it would just almost disappear overnight. And it was this this chemistry that was going on. And there's some really, really interesting history behind this. I'm, I'm both a scientist and a, and a history buff when it comes to this, but um, there's some really interesting history of how quickly scientists pulled together the right instruments, got down there, figured out the chemistry that was going on. Um, and then there's a really nice lesson because what happened was the scientists were able to persuade the community at large, mm-hmm. that this was a problem, that losing ozone meant increase in skin cancer to all of us. Mm-hmm. Our rates of skin cancer now are higher because there's less ozone, especially in these polar regions. Mm-hmm. So they were able to make that statement. Um, at the same time, um, this is a bit of a spoiler alert perhaps, but the companies that were producing these CFCs were denying that they had this effect while 
simultaneously working on some of the replacement technologies for them. Mm -hmm. So there had to be a concerted international effort to say these are the cause of, of what we believe is going on. Mm -hmm. um, there were regulations put in place. Um, the CFCs were changed into less harmful materials that still did the job that we needed them to. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a beautiful success story of, of science. Now, um, here's the thing to your question. The, the ozone hole is still there. Um, over the last few years, people have seen the rate slow. Um, it's probably starting to close. There's a few reports that you know we're starting to get less and less ozone loss, but the ozone hole itself is probably still going to be with us for several decades. So cool. we're still going to be dealing with these, these chemicals that got put into the atmosphere in the 70s, 80s, into the 90s, still for decades to come. That's how long they last in the atmosphere. Wow. So it's a success story. We're doing better, but we haven't fixed the problem yet. Mm -hmm. So um, so if somebody says, you know, why aren't you talking about the ozone hole anymore? Um, it is still there, but we believe we understand the vast majority of the chemistry that went on, and we believe we've put the regulations in place to not allow that to happen. Um, now, that isn't inherently tied to global warming. Um, global warming um, happens to be the current sort of biggest problem that we're facing as atmospheric scientists. Um, the thing that we're most trying to understand and the, the thing that you can think of what we just talked about with the ozone hole, that we're trying to follow the same path, you know, make the public, make politicians aware of this issue, um, try to put regulations in place that are going to lead to a solution to the problem. Um, you could probably argue, though, that we're not having quite as much success as maybe folks had with, mm -hmm. with ozone um, and, and those regulations in the 80s into the 90s. Yeah, definitely not. It seems to be more resistance. I'm not sure why, but there seems to be more resistance to the science behind it. Yeah, unfortunately, it seems like that is the case right now. Which is, which is intriguing about our society, I guess. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing that, that folks, and this is not, you know, like an original thought on my part, but a, a lot of folks have talked about that um, when it came to regulating CFCs, there were a handful of companies that were making these chemicals, and so you could put pressure on them. You could find a replacement technology, mm -hmm. um, and, and you, could, you could get to a solution rather rapidly. Um, so much of our economy is based around fossil fuels, which emit CO2, um, and then there's lesser greenhouse gases. Um, those CFCs we just talked about are actually mm -hmm. potent greenhouse gases. Um, methane, which comes from a variety of sources, is another potent greenhouse gas. Um, there's so many more emitters that it's much harder. You can't sort of, you know, push that power on, on one small sector to get a change. Um, there, there's a much broader effort that's needed. I think it's just it, it inconveniences Joe Public to think that I, something I'm doing, I might need mm -hmm. to change in order to help the world's future. It's yeah, it's a, interesting. We, I mean, we had success. You know, people had aerosol cans. People had foam in, in their couch cushions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and somehow, you know, we were able to make that case. Um, and we were able to get the public largely behind that and politicians largely behind that um, regulations in place. Um, so th this is a very different beast right now. And, and it's, you know, a lot of scientists want to push on that same process because it was so successful with, with ozone loss. Um, but we don't seem to be having as much success. And so figuring out exactly what it is that it's going to take um, is one of the challenges, not for scientists necessarily, mm -hmm. more for policymakers and, and politicians and, and probably the, the public at large as they start to see more and more of the impacts of climate change occurring. Yeah. Now, as you're here at Purdue, um, well, first of all, how do you have time to do research and be department head? Is it like, because it's, <laughs> It seems like department head is, you know, a full-time 90-hour-a-week job. And so how in the world are you doing research? Yeah, I, I've uh, cloned myself. No. Uh, <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, there, there's a, a couple of things. Um, first off, yeah, department head is, is certainly a full-time job. Um, and, you know, this is a great department. And so it's, it's really a trust, you know, making sure that it continues to do mm. as well as it has in the past. Um, and, and so you do have to carve out that time. You do have to sort of be selfish and, and mark out, you know, certain blocks on your calendar that you're going to do research. Um, but, but the thing that I have really going for me is working with some really remarkable folks. And mm -hmm. so there's a couple of wonderful postdocs in the group here at Purdue, um, Justin and Jali, um, and, and then some fantastic students, Martin and Leslie, back at, at MIT who are, are finishing off their, their uh, degrees there. 
And so um, in a lot of ways, you know, it's it's not me doing this great work. It's it's really them and it's enabling them. And, and so in that way, being department head and, and being a group lead are, are kind of the same thing is that you're enabling others to do the great work. Um, and then maybe like a quarterback in the NFL, you just take all the credit for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just joking. You, 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 you try to make it clear that those are the folks doing the work you're just enabling. So oh, that's awesome. That's really so what research are you looking at now? Oh, yeah, great question. Um, so one of the things as department head was that, um, you know, you have to sort of cut back. You have, to, you have to pick the projects that you're most interested in. And so I would say that the top two that we're interested in are a project with NASA right now um, to put a, a mass spectrometer, an instrument capable of understanding the composition of particles on one of their research aircraft. Um, and so that, that's a really fun project and one that we're going to be doing, um, really uh, spinning it up in 2020 and doing measurements. The other one is uh, to look at, at clouds. And to look at clouds, you have to go where clouds are. Um, we're lucky to partner with some folks in Colorado that have a mountaintop site. And so this is the Desert Research Institute's Storm Peak Laboratory. The reason that we like that, um, other than that there's great skiing there, <laughs> is that um, there, there's clouds there over half the time over the winter season. And you get these very special clouds that are called mixed phase clouds. Um, so earlier I mentioned warm clouds and cold mm -hmm. clouds, mm -hmm. liquid water versus ice clouds. There's something called mixed phase clouds that have water and ice in them. Um, and they're actually the least understood cloud type that we have in our atmosphere. And Storm Peak has these things in spades during the, the winter time. So you, you have these, uh, you know, high prevalence of them, maybe more than half the time. And so we were able to go there, uh, take our equipment there, set it up over the winter season and, and be in clouds almost every other day. And then, you know, you can go skiing when it's clear out. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, some of the conversations that I've been a part of and, and been listening to lately, I've heard um, mentioned a couple of different times that something about we might have more clouds today than we had several hundred years ago. Now, is this something that you've heard or is this something... Yeah, so, so that's very likely the case. So as we as humans um, put out more of these particles, mm -hmm. um, the atmosphere almost certainly uh, has a lot more particulate matter now than it had a few hundred years ago, pre-industrial. Okay. So we as scientists love to um, cut the, the timeline into two periods, pre-industrial and post-industrial. Oh, sure. um, and so there's no great date for it. People talk about the year 1750 as being the start of the industrial period, but you can mm -hmm. pick a date. Um, but almost certainly before that date, there were a lot fewer particles in the atmosphere than there are now, um, probably by a factor of two. Um, in some regions, when you think of polluted cities, probably by a factor of 10 or more. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, and those particles are, some of those particles are good at forming clouds. So the result, when you think about it, is that you probably have changed cloud properties and you probably have clouds in places that they aren't now. Um, now, one of the problems and something we're working on is trying to get that record because there wasn't a measurement of clouds oh. going on in 1750. Sure. Right? Yeah. So, um, so, so this is a problem because we'd love to have like these high resolution records going back in time. Um, people don't often realize we, we only have good temperature records, um, you know, modern scientific thermometers in a number of locations going back to about 1800. And so cloud measurements, global cloud measurements, really are sort of in our lifetime. They're, they're satellite records. Um, but even satellite records seem to track and seem to indicate an increase in clouds over that period of time. Before that, we have to use proxies. We have to extrapolate. We have to think about, it. are there ways that, you know, we can somehow judge cloud records? And there's a few observations, you know, places like airports and lighthouses right. that judge it going back further in time. Those are pretty non-scientific data, so we have to sort of struggle to, to figure out. But um, in answer to your question, yeah, it, it's almost certain that, you know, the, the atmosphere we experience now, the prevalence of clouds, the particulates, is very different if you can jump in a time machine and go back a couple hundred years. Um, I think people would be really surprised by how different uh, the air quality as, as well as sort of just the atmosphere itself is different. Wow. It's neat. <laughs> How do you focus, um, which is a very broad question, but your research, because when you start talking about the atmosphere and you're working with instrumentation to actually collect data, right? Is that, I'm, okay, yeah, I want to make sure that's what I understood, right? right? Yeah. And so it, how do you focus on one thing? There seems like there's so many things you can, 
you measure it. And then when you were at JPL, they're looking at other pl- atmospheric of other planets. Then when you come mm-hmm. somewhere like Purdue, we have atmosphere planetary scientists. And so I, I mean, every day I would come up, I, I would be, oh no, I could also, we could also, could we? I want it. How do you focus all those questions and stay driven on a project to see through with that project before accidentally jumping to another one? <laughs> it's a great question, and, and uh, hopefully there's some young scientists out there that we, we can reach on this one. Um, it, it's a really hard lesson to learn because as scientists, you know, we get inspired and we get intrigued by different problems. And, you know, two months down the road, you could be doing 15 different things not well. Yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. so I, I think that what I've tried to do, and probably not, you know, perfectly at, all the time, um, is is to pick the things that you know the group and I are most interested in, because um, they've got a say in it too, right? They they're the ones that are doing the work. Mm-hmm. So if they want to start going down a, a different path, um, I have to support them and and try to help them down that path. Mm-hmm. Um, but we we try to focus, um, and so you know we try to find a couple of broad areas that, that we want to work in. Um, we sort of trim the branches on the tree if, if we find that we're getting, you know, sort of too far off the path. So, Stephen, you just mentioned, um, you know, planetary atmospheres. Mm-hmm. And so the group a few years ago and I were, were working a lot on planetary atmospheres. Um, we had a chance to uh, work with Alexandria Johnson, who's, who's now uh, a member of the department here, um, looking at things like uh, cloud formation around Mars. Um, mm. So Mars has clouds. Um, it has particles in the atmosphere. It has, I about that. I did. Yeah, it has, <laughs> it has precipitation. There's snowfall on Mars. It's very interesting because it's not only water ice snowfall. They also have CO2 ice in Mars' atmosphere because it's colder. Oh, boy, yeah. Yeah, so it's really fascinating. It, it's all the same physics. It's all the same chemistry as what we do on Earth, um, but around a different planet. And so we were doing that for a while. We had some folks in the group that were really intrigued by it. Um, but as time has gone on, we've, we've sort of had to prune that part of the tree so that we can focus on, on other mm-hmm. things. And, and so for the young scientists out there, it really is key that, you know, you, your, your gut instinct is to say yes, 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 and, and do all of these projects. Mm-hmm. But you have to be rather careful and, and make sure that you're finding a, a couple of paths that you can put a lot of effort in and, and make progress in. Um, as opposed to doing, you know, a number of, of different things at, at some very basic level. So it's a hard lesson to learn. I don't think, you know, especially when you're starting out in this this career, this field, mm-hmm. um, it, it's real easy to understand. Um, as you get a bit older, you start realizing that you sometimes have to say no even to things that you really want to do so that you can spend more time, put more focus on the things that are really important. It, and that can be applied across the board. I mean, for a minute there, I wasn't sure if you were answering a question or lecturing us. Right. Uh, that's, because, that's you know, wait a minute. Advice, I think, how many things are we into? <laughs> wait, we are into doing. I was just say thing, examining my conscience here, like, oh man, I, I need so, to say uh, no more. It, it might have sounded like lecturing, but it was really reminding myself that I have to no, do I better at that as well. So. well. I think to some degree, though, I think even my high school students wrestled with that. I think um, the school where I taught, it was so easy to be involved in everything. And I think there's expectations that the students be involved in as much as they can. And and I think what you're pointing to, can you do that and still do it well? And I think that's a question you really have to examine. Yeah, no, it really is true. And um, one of my mentors was, was really great about that because they said that, you know, as, as you get older, um, you're used to saying no to things you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. It gets really hard because at some point in your career, you're starting to say no to things that you do want to do and that's when things change that's when you have to really sort of you know look in that mirror and say what do, what do we want to accomplish what do we want to do um it, it's that's really really difficult and it's something yeah. i think that only comes with experience when you just don't have enough time to do things and and then you have to say what do i have to cut out what do i have to say no to sure that's great advice <laughs> 50 to 100 years from now yeah you you work on instruments right now and science instruments stuff. So 50 to 100 years from now, science, your area, where will we be? Ooh. Um, and we talked about how legislation's changed already and different mm-hmm. where. Yeah, you guys have the best questions. That's a, that's a great one. That's <laughs> my favorite one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, there's this, uh, this is a weird way to answer, but there's this report called the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC report. So this is the all of the world's leading scientists get together and sort of talk about climate change and how it projects into the future 50 mm-hmm. years out. Um, so this is the tie to your question. Uh, those projections have 
sort of a business as usual scenario. We as a planet don't change anything that we're doing. Um, and then they have sort of, you know, the optimum scenario where, you know, we all get our acts together. We find a way to cut down on fossil fuels, maybe find a way to sequester the carbon dioxide that gets into the atmosphere um, and, and keep the atmosphere something like it is now or perhaps even clean it up compared to now and get it closer to those pre-industrial times. And so those two paths are meant to sort of bracket what we could be doing in the future. And those two paths those two paths probably bracket what my future and, and my colleague's future is going to look like, right? If we don't do anything, if it's business as usual and we keep emitting fossil fuels at an increasing rate, we're going to be living in a planet that is very different than today. Mm -hmm. And we're probably going to be making measurements trying to understand what's happening. We're going to be using models to try to understand what the future of this planet holds and how different it's going to be. Um, so that might not be be a future that's all that different than what we're doing today. Um, I'm, I'm very optimistic that that's not going to be the case. Um, I like to joke that, you know, if we get our act together, I may be out of a job, which would be great. <laughs> um, you know, maybe we will do so well at this that we will, we will understand the Earth system at a much higher level than we do now. I'm sure there's still going to be questions and things that we want to look at, but maybe they won't be as pressing. Maybe we won't have that ozone hole. We won't have that global warming, that climate change issue. We'll know enough about those things that we can dial back and start looking at something else. We were talking about clouds around Mars. Mm -hmm. um, there's clouds around exoplanets. Um, trying to understand those types of things, you know, using the skills that we've developed now um, to understand the worlds that we're going to be exploring as opposed to the planet that we're living on. I like that. Me too. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. We appreciate you coming and sharing your story and kind of where you've come. I think we've asked you maybe 1% of the questions we actually have. But uh, so uh, we might be asking you back. Episode number two. Uh, we might be asking you back because there's a lot more questions. We, we only hit the iceberg, I think, with you. Mm -hmm. And so, but thank you. We appreciate it. Yes. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. I really appreciate doing this. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you love superheroes of science, be sure to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast player. Be sure to join us as we add interviews of scientists and incorporate discussions of current trends in K-12 science. Until next time, be super and remember, you are someone's hero. Boiler up. Hammer down. <laughs> <laughs>